A Brief History of the Keen Wonder Mine, located in Death Valley, California, brought to you by Ghost Town Wonders. Hey, good morning, everyone. We're going to take a trip today out to a place known as uh, Keen Wonder Mine. It's located about 130 miles north of uh, Las Vegas in uh, Death Valley National Park. We're going to go up there and take some videos and create a YouTube and talk a little bit about the history of the Keen Wonder Mine. Ready to hit the road? Got my coffee here. Ready to go. Let's go have some fun. Today, we're very fortunate to be driving down Daylight Pass into Death Valley National Park and witnessing the beautiful views that we can see from our windshield of a car. Unlike those prospectors back in the day, especially during the uh, summer months when the heat was unbearable. As I'm driving towards the Keen Wonder Mine, I'm just in awe of the beauty of Death Valley and how daunting the rise of the funeral mountains are and how difficult it must have been to prospect in these areas. The history of this mine starts out in December of 1903 when two prospectors wandered into the Funeral Mountains on the east side of Death Valley. Like so many others, these two men were among the horde of prospectors scanning the deserts and mountain ranges of southern Nevada for gold spurred on by the fabulous riches discovered shortly before at Tonopah and Goldfield. What brought them to this particular area is unrecorded, but perhaps they had heard about the old chloride cliff mine nearby, which had operated briefly in the funeral range in the 1870s. The two prospectors named Domingo Echeron and Jack Keane found an outcropping of silver ore. The two men worked the discovery for several months, attempting to trace the outcropping to a silver load, but they were unsuccessful. Then, quite by accident, Jack Keane discovered an immense ledge of free milling gold ore a short distance from the original silver location. The discovery was aptly named the Keane Wonder and represented the first major strike after eight years of desert prospecting. Keene was sure he had a great thing. Trouble was, he had no money to develop the mine. Keene wasted no time in trying to connect with people that had the money to invest into his mine. He went down to Furnace Creek Ranch that same day, borrowed a saddle horse, and rode to Ballarat. Within 12 days, Captain Delamar's expert was called home from Alaska and on the ground within five weeks. From the day of the location, Keen and his partner had $10,000 of Delamar's money on a bond and leased note that read $160,000. Captain Delamar was a very successful mining operator and investor. The Keen Wonders strike predated the Bullfrog strike over in Nevada, and therefore there was no rhyolite to turn to for supplies. The supply point for the Keen Wonder camp was from Ballarat, California, 70 miles across Death Valley, Panamint Range. In the east, there was nothing. There was a young gold field that was 80 miles north of the area, and where Las Vegas now stands, there was nothing but a ranch. Despite its isolation at that time, by July of 1904, there were perhaps 500 men roaming the canyons and crests of the north end of the Funeral Mountains, staking anything that looked like a rock for miles around. This mine did not uh, remain isolated for very long. In J August of 1904, Shorty Harris made the bullfrog strike that started a chain of events that led to the boom city of Rhyolite, only about 18 miles away, and the building of not one, but two railroads in the valley east of the Funeral Mountains. Captain Jack Delamar allowed his lease to expire, and it was picked up by John Campbell from Rhyolite and he organized the King Wonder Mining Company and had a capitalization of 1.5 million shares to develop the mine. So in August of 1906, Keen and Echeron sold out. 
it's said that Domingo Etron uh, received his fifty thousand dollars in cash and ended up going to Dar moving to Darwin where he bought a store and he became active in the Inyo County affairs. And Jack Keane ended up moving over to Ballarat where he proceeded to get in trouble. He had a drinking problem, got into a gunfight and shot somebody. And then eventually he was kicked out of the area and it was said that he migrated over back to Ireland. The new mining company hired a mining expert by the name of Homer Wilson and he gained most of his experience in the mother load of California and was well regarded as a practical mining man. He announced the company would erect a mill at the base of the mountain and an aerial tramway to transport the ore down from the mine. It was announced that the mill will start with 20 stamps, but is planned to immediately increase that capacity to 40 stamps as soon as the first 20 are in full operation. I want to give credit where it's due. This wonderful, fantastic exhibit was created by the Historic American Engineering Record, a program that documents historically significant engineering and industrial works in the United States. This field work was performed and Drawings were measured and a historical report was created in the summer of 2001. Some water was developed near the mill site down at the bottom, but Wilson was eager to develop any of the springs in the mountains above. By April of 1907, and the company had bought the Keene Springs town site and rights to the water. The machinery and equipment for the development of the Keene Wonder Mine started to arrive at Rhyolite. From there, the equipment and supplies had to be transported through very rough roads over to the mine. Supplies continued to be delivered by freight wagons until summer of 1909, when an enterprising man by the name of Joseph R. Lane acquired a 110 horsepower traction engine that had been used at the mines at Calico. It was capable of pulling four wagons loaded with 50 tons, though for the Keen Wonder Mine it only run two wagons. Lane was only able to fulfill about four months of his contract for hauling material to the mine. His engine finally collapsed in November of uh, 1909 and the engine was deemed of no further use. The traction engine was left exactly where it stood at least until May of 1911 and then eventually it was moved down to Furnace Creek Ranch where it sits still today. The Keen Wonder Mine actually had two camps. The one at the mine provided a bunkhouse and a boarding house for the miners in addition to some mining buildings. The camp at the mill, which was at the bottom of the hill, was a very important one. It was a town unto itself having a store and for a while a post office. In addition, the mill and cyanide tanks, there was a boarding house bunkhouse and a handsome frame building which was the manager of Homer Wilson's house. This photo is some folks uh, that have arrived there at the lower campsite. Perhaps it even could be Wilson and his family. Here is a few historical photos of the uh, mill site. This is what the mill site and the leaching area looks like today. You can see a few of the remnants out there in the back, some of the water tanks. This is looking um, west and kind of north of where the actual mill site is today. You can see the pipeline, some of the pipeline that's laid up out on top of the ground. One of the sources of water came from a spring located in that area. You can see quite a bit of debris left out there, especially related to settling tanks. You can also see the tailings piles out there, that uh, clay looking color out there that doesn't look like it belongs. This is just some more uh, debris showing the settling tanks and where the mill used to stand. This is kind of the beginning of the adventure. This is the hike to go start seeing the uh, tramway and the ruins as you leave from your parking area. 
some of it is quite steep as you can see. So follow along. Let's start out by looking at the uh, terminal tram and the processing plant at the bottom of the hill. So this is the first real structure that you see after you leave the parking lot. That large tank that you see before you is a 125 horsepower Sterling boiler. That's what was used to uh, drive the stamp mill. And that up above that big structure right there is known as the discharge terminal. You can see the concrete face there with a hole in it. That wooden structure above is known as a secondary ore bin. It's after the material has gone through the jaw crusher once it leaves the ore buckets from the tramway. And then once it goes to that concrete hole there, it enters into the stamp mills, which is no longer there today, but this is what it may have looked like back in the day. This right here is part of one of the cable wheels. You can see the groove right in there. That's where the cable would have fit. You can see some of those new timbers there. They were installed by the Park Service to keep that structure from further deteriorating. And this is also just another view of the uh, discharge terminal and the valley floor below. This is a terminal structure for the tramway. You can still see the frames that held the uh, ore buckets and the cabling for the uh, for the ore buckets. And that platform is just probably the work surface area that they were used back in the day. There's a park service sign on this structure that says keep off, so I'm gonna respect that, but it's outstanding, beautiful structure. This pipeline is another water source from the valley below. It's actually about the same elevation as the uh, mill site, about a little over a mile to the north. It was known as Keen Wonder Springs, not to be confused with Keen Springs, which was another water source on the other side of the Funeral Mountains. This water tank was storage for the boiler at the mill site. This was the uh, beginning of the trailhead that led you up to the top of the tramway. It didn't get much better than what you see there at the beginning. This pipeline came from another source on the other side of the Funeral Mountain Range. It came from a place called Keen Springs. And you can see here the bend in the pipe. There were several locations of that along the entire alignment used to kind of help slow down the velocity on such a steep grade and also served as an expansion joint. The most impressive and intact original technology feature of the Keen Wonder mine site is the aerial tramway, which spans 4,800 feet, a distance between the upper workings and the mill area, and rises over an elevation of 1,200 feet. After the mining company searched many different tramway systems, they finally decided on 
purchasing the tramway from a group called Litchin Brothers and Company in St. Louis, Missouri. And once it was built, the tramway ran continuously between 1907 and 1912. The beginning of 1907, there was a lot of construction activity as materials continued to arrive from rhyolite. Construction continued at the mill site and the tramway was also being constructed at that same time. The tramway became operational in October of 1907. Standing up here currently on the tramway, right next to some tramway towers. You can see behind me there, they continue to go up to the mining area. So pretty good hike up to this location. Fortunately, it's a beautiful day. I'm going to continue to walk up a little ways further and see what I can find. But that's the view behind me down into the Death Valley. Quite amazing. You can see this colored rock. I have no idea what it is. I'll look it up when I get back. But There's another bend in the pipe. Right there you can see the trail came up. I was down at those lower towers right there. It's quite a bit of a vertical difference in elevation. Get pretty winded coming up this uh, trail. This is a tough hike. Tougher than I thought. There's a very steep trail that I've come up so far. And uh, the idea was to get up to the upper part of the mine. Still a long ways to go. As I'm walking up this trail, I recall reading something from uh, September of 1907 from the Rhyolite Bullfrog Miner, which was a local newspaper at the time. And it states that uh, the mining superintendent was talking about building the tramway. And he was stating that in order to get the material up to the upper terminal, it was necessary to enlarge our trail to five feet in width. This also had to be blasted out of solid rock and have six of McDonald's best horses hauling up the material, there being something like two cars of lumber and one of machinery to go up, the larger portion of which is already in place, and the 12 towers are also in position. This is the water line that I was following almost all the way up. You can see it's suspended across this little washout here by another pipe. In the places that I could, I decided to go ahead and film some of my trek up the trail. And I only did that where I thought it was deemed safe to do so. As I was walking up, I ran across this mine adit. I'm not sure exactly what it had been used for, but it was gated off. And it was nowhere near any place to displace the ore. On my hike up, I almost ran across this continuously, this beautiful sheen on this rock, kind of giving you an idea of the scale of it. These photos and recording do not really do it justice, but it was quite fascinating, beautiful color. Continuing my hike up this so-called five foot wide trail, and some of the areas were pretty sketchy with some very steep drop offs. They said at the beginning they hauled all their equipment up here and their timbers and everything to construct the tramway by horseback. That would have been one challenge to be able to haul those up there in that kind of terrain.
this is it there it is this is what I hiked up this long steep trail for that's the loading terminal we're gonna go and take a closer look though this is what it looked like though when it was in operation and all the buildings were still standing you can see it's far more complete that piece of equipment up there is a winching machine we'll go take a detailed look at it here in a moment here's a detailed view of the winching engine which is located at the upper tram terminal the cable from this engine leads down into a deep ravine in front of the upper tram terminal it was probably used to drag materials up toward the terminal when the terminal was being constructed or in times of a tramway breakdown the drive engine is in the background two long operating levers from the engine are in the center of foreground an extra spool of cable is on the ground to the right of the engine a water pipeline stretches across the slope in the background carrying water to the upper mines this is a view of the uppermost mine access point it's all fenced off by the National Park Service for safety reasons that debris pile of lumber below is actually the collapsed tram tower which is the first tower after leaving the loading terminal this is a uh, at it that's where they loaded up the ore carts the ore came down from a natural chute that was underground from the mine way above emptied into the ore carts and then they wheeled them out over to the crusher and the ore bin at the upper tramway this is a diagram of the natural chute this diagram was created by the historic American engineering record this is a view down the valley from the loading terminal looking towards the breakover tower this is a loading terminal we'll take a walk a look around here and see what we can find you can see that structure in the background that's the big uh, ore bin you can see the rail where the ore carts were riding on Here's some more of these cable wheels. The smaller one right there was known as a secondary traction cable and tensioning wheel. This large one was a primary traction cable and wheel. That shaft right there is a six inch diameter shaft that comes down from a bevel gear from above that drives the wheel. This is where the ore carts turned 180 degrees. This is an ore bin. This is where they would have dumped the ore into the cable cars. That right there looks like a belt wheel that drives that gear and then goes over to that bevel gear and the shaft down to the cable wheel. You can see what appears to be an electric motor up above. This is a view from the top. You can see the electric motor out there to the right. A belt would have been attached to that and then ran over to the belt wheel. And then the belt wheel over to the gear. And then the gear transfers over to the bevel gear. And then the bevel gear has a solid shaft on that goes down to the cable wheel.
This area we're looking at right here was actually the blacksmith's forge and work area. You can see the anvil block and that pipe there was probably compressed air to stoke the coal. Well, this concludes my video and short history and the wonderful day I had at the Keen Wonder Mine. I hope you all enjoyed it as well. Please make sure you subscribe and hit the like button for future videos of similar nature.